Oh yes, Denver, Colorado. This will be my first video of 28 on the Mile High City. For this video, we're going to stay in downtown or the Central Business District. I'll start by saying this. It's fair to say that this town has had a rough stretch of several years. Things have been going downhill fast, and you can only hope that it stops soon. Denver used to have one of the best reputations for a major city in the country. Denver had a reputation of being a very clean, progressive city with a great economy and high-paying jobs. Homes here at one point couldn't stay on the market for more than a half hour. It was one of the top cities for millennials to move to in the nation for about a 10-year stretch. But that all came to a screeching halt back in 2020. Because now, people can't move out of here fast enough. But despite what everyone says about Denver these days, you know, how it's full of trash and homeless people or... I guess the politically correct term to use is, um, unhoused people. Yeah, that term will be offensive in 10 years too. But anyway, Denver really is a beautiful city. And of course I say that while I drive past a row of overflowed dumpsters. You know, I really tried to start things positive. I really did, Denver, but I couldn't save you from yourself there. No, really. All kidding aside, as we go along, you'll see that Denver really is a beautiful city. Okay, why is there trash everywhere? Like, literally, all over the street. The garbage cans in the parks are just overflowed, and there's little pieces of garbage all over the street. It's, it's impossible to ignore. All right, well, anyway, let's try this again. Denver, Colorado really is a beautiful city. If you're a sucker for big city skylines, Denver really does have a nice one to look at with the mountains providing a nice backdrop. Can't deny that. Well, I invaded Denver in July of 22 on a really nice and clear morning, and for this video I drove through pretty much all of downtown Denver, so you'll get to see what all of it has to offer in this video. The first thing that you'll notice these days when you visit Denver is how the city promotes an outdoor lifestyle. The Mile High City wants their residents to be active and to enjoy the outdoors, and to that I can say... Mission accomplished, because when I drove through the entire city back in July of 22, I'm pretty sure I saw every dog breed imaginable as there were so many people outside going for a walk or a jog. Way more so than any city that I've seen in the Midwest, which is where I live. The entire city is extremely walkable, as neighborhoods everywhere have bike paths and nice sidewalks. A lot of the neighborhoods have nice little districts, too, where you can shop and dine. It seems like if you own a house in Denver, no matter where you are in the city, that is, unless you're in this weird section all the way out here, you're close to a nice block of restaurants and shops that you can walk to, and it won't be that far of a walk. In my opinion, that's how a major city should be. That's right. Have a giant gas-guzzling car that burns fossil fuels into the environment for the days that you want a change of scenery. You know, have just strong enough of a carbon footprint to make all the hippies mad, but you also have to have the option to just get out and walk somewhere whenever you feel like it. Another positive for the Mile High City is that Denver has some of the best weather in the country. That is, if you take away all the places along the coastline, especially Southern California, take away Florida. You know, Denver has some of the best weather in the country, no doubt. The region sees about 300 days of sun on average throughout the year. And when I say that, I mean at least a couple hours of sunshine a day. And that's a big reason as to why this place has become so popular for millennials to move to, that is, until 2020. Well, another thing that you'll notice when you look around is you see a bunch of newer-looking residential towers, whether they're apartments or condos. This comes with the territory of Denver being one of the most popular places to move to from about 2010 to 2020. So you have a lot of these newer buildings, a lot more so than many of the other major cities that you'll come across these days. But another thing that you'll notice very quickly when you visit downtown Denver is in the shadows of all of these new luxurious living spaces where people are inside just lathering up in their bathtubs and living the life, in the shadows of these buildings are homeless tents as Denver has become one of the hardest hit cities in the country on the matter of homelessness. And I can already hear many of you saying, Oh, don't focus on the negative, Chris. If the negative is all you ever look for, then that's all you'll ever see. This video is garbage. Yeah. Look, I'm not one of those oblivious positive people, okay? I know that you have a new quarterback in town that goes about his business that way. Yeah, how's that turning out for him? But 
Anyway, yeah, that's not me. And what I'm saying is not wrong, because when you drive around downtown Denver, especially during the crack of dawn as I did on this nice July day back in 22, it's impossible to ignore the amount of homeless people that sleep on the city streets. In fact, you'll be seeing it quite often throughout this video, and most of the time I'm not going to even acknowledge it. Anyway, some of these homeless people don't even have tents. What's even crazier is that the problem is even worse today than it was when I filmed this video a year ago. And for a video on Denver's homeless problem, make sure to check out my Denver playlist down below, as I have a video uploaded on that already. So if you want to hear more about that, go check out that video, because in this video, I'm mostly going to be pointing out different landmarks or other points of interest that are located either in or around downtown Denver, and I'll be talking about the history of the city and how it came to be along with some other talking points about what it's like to live here during modern times, and hopefully, if you didn't know squat about Denver before, you'll know everything that there is to know about Denver after watching this video. Alright, so let's move on. So far in this video, we've been driving around Denver's lower downtown district, and as you've seen, for the most part, things look really nice and clean here. There's a bunch of newer and modern-looking mixed-use buildings, and it's extremely pedestrian-friendly. Commons Park also seems to be a nice complement to the awesome collection of amenities in Lower Downtown. That is, as long as the garbage truck comes and empties the trash cans. But, along with all of this, you also have Ball Arena, where the Denver Nuggets and Colorado Avalanche play. Both teams have won championships in recent years. You also have Coors Field, where the Colorado Rockies play, all within walking distance. So that's three out of the four professional Rocky Mountain sports teams that are all within walking distance. That's a pretty sweet deal if you ask me. Now, when it comes to the fourth professional team in town, Empower Field at Mile High, you'd have better luck getting a shuttle as it's on the other side of the river and the I-25 freeway. So that one is not as easily accessible when walking from here or when walking from anywhere else around the downtown area. But given the current state of the Broncos these days, you probably don't want to go to a game anyway, unless you're a fan of the opposite team, of course. But you also have the theme park in Elitch Gardens within walking distance from the lower downtown area, so that's cool, I guess. Also, you have the downtown Denver Aquarium, but I get the feeling that those are more so for the tourists than they are for the residents. That being said, there's many things within Lower Downtown to keep all of the residents entertained, as there are as many as 100 or so restaurants, bars, clubs, shops, and other like amenities that are located within the Lower Downtown neighborhood, as the Lodo website so claims. Point being, there's plenty of things to do around here. There are dozens and dozens of options to entertain yourself with, all within walking distance too, so if you live in Lower Downtown, that means that you don't ever have to fight traffic along Big Bad I-25 in order to not only get to your place of employment, but also just to enjoy any of the amenities in downtown Denver. That's right, so all of the other people who mock you for spending so much money to live in downtown Denver, you can just point the finger right back at them and laugh when they're losing their hair and fighting traffic on I-25. I mean, you can just walk to your favorite bar or club or restaurant or any other event that's going on in downtown. You don't have to drive here and then pay a premium to park somewhere, so if you enjoy the amenities that downtown Denver has to offer and you're a big baller and you have a high-paying job in downtown, why not? You know, there's some real value to never have to drive on I-25 to get somewhere important ever again. That's coming from someone who's driven on I-25 several times over the last couple of years. And I feel like most of the people who buy or rent in Lower Downtown know that. That's why the people who live here are willing to pay that premium, so that they can live hard, work hard, and play hard all in the same area, and they don't have to drive 30 minutes in order to get to their stomping grounds, right? Yeah, well, with that said, if you decide to live in Lower Downtown, you better not ever complain about being bored. I mean, you live right in the middle of all of the action, and it costs a fortune to do so. So, if you ever complain about being bored, and you bought a place or rent a place in Lower Downtown, yeah, you have a new name. We're going to call you Bored Guy. More on Lower Downtown in a minute, as sometimes, Bored Guy can be found wandering the premises of Union Station. This is one of the more historic landmarks in downtown Denver, as it's one of the city's oldest buildings. The original Union Station was opened on June 1st, 1881, and at the time, it was the tallest building in the West. The original structure burned down, however, three years later due to an electric fire, so it had to be rebuilt. 
But as Denver continued to rapidly grow into being a major city, the train station needed to be rebuilt yet again. So the Union Station that Denverites all know and love today was originally opened in 1914. The station has seen three presidents roll through, those being Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. So that's all good and dandy. Now, most of us know that during the 19th century, train travel was the most common form of long-distance transportation here in the United States, so having a train station really helped Denver grow into being a major city. And after seeing a peak of about 50,000 travelers daily during the World War II era, train travel started to decline not only here, but of course everywhere in the country, and eventually Union Station started to become an eyesore. In 2001, however, efforts were made to revitalize Union Station, and today, not only is it still being used as a train station, but it's also used as an event venue. Plus, there's shopping inside and a hotel, so despite train travel not being what it used to be, Denver has found a way to not only preserve one of its historic gyms, but also make nice use of it for modern times, so that's pretty neat. And here's the southeastern face of Union Station, as before, we saw the opposite side. Well, anyway, we're still prowling around the lower downtown area. The official premises of the lower downtown district stretches from the South Platte River to Lawrence Street and in between 14th and 20th Streets. But let's get back to talking about bored guy living in downtown Denver, because seriously, why would anyone choose to live in a place such as Lower Downtown and pay such an inflated price to either rent or own, and then on top of that complain about how there's nothing to do? A quick look on Zillow shows that there are no places to buy here under a half million bucks unless you're satisfied with 600 square feet. You know, a place that's so small that your kitchen countertop also serves as your side table for your bed. But can we talk about the name of Lodo? Like seriously, is that name supposed to be cool and trendy or something? Because honestly, I prefer saying the full name. So many people these days are trying to be cool with their acronyms and shortened names for everything. Lower Downtown just sounds like a better name to me. Like, if I'm new to Denver and I hear someone say Lower Downtown, I'm going to know exactly where to look to find that. If someone says Lodo to me, and I've never heard of that name before, I would probably look at them all crazy like, wait, what did you just say? Lodo? Is that supposed to be the name of a donut shop or something? Like, Lodo? That sounds like a low-calorie donut shop. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a hater. Or maybe I'm just like bored guy who complains about how there's nothing to do. <laughs> maybe if I lived here, it would just be me and bored guy walking down the street because we don't have any other friends. You know, bored guy will be complaining about how everything around us is lame and how there's nothing to do. And and on the flip side, I'll be ripping on everyone who calls the place Lodo and we'll both be miserable together. All right. Well, moving on. Yeah, let's let's move on. Well, after seeing the entire downtown and after seeing the entire city, lower downtown is probably my favorite area of Denver. When I think of big cities, I want to have an urban feel. Lower downtown gives me that. When I think of places that are desirable to live in, I want to be within walking distance of amenities, and I want options. Lower downtown has plenty of options. I feel like a young person, or an older active person for that matter, would never get bored here if they could afford living in the lower downtown area, and they would never have to get into their car and drive somewhere for their day-to-day -day life, and that would be quite a nice life, to be honest with you. Alright, so as we make the turn straight ahead is Coors Field, home of the Colorado Rockies of the MLB. The stadium opened in 1995, and it was actually the first ballpark with heated infield grass. Opening day in Major League Baseball is usually anywhere from the last week of March to the first week of April, and during the very early parts of the Major League Baseball season, there's always going to be a chance in Denver for some snow, so having a heated baseball field is justified. When it comes to the play of baseball, Coors Field is known for being one of the best ballparks for power hitters in the major leagues. On the flip side, it's a pitcher's worst nightmare, since Coors Field is in the Mile High City, you know, being 5,280 feet above sea level, or a mile above sea level. Because of that, the air here is thinner and drier than in most other places throughout the country. Those conditions help the baseballs gain a 9% boost, so to say, in traveling distance, as the baseball itself is harder due to the drier air. 
For example, if a hitter were to hit a ball that would usually travel 400 feet at most other MLB stadiums at Coors Field, that same ball would have traveled 440 feet. That being said, the stadium was designed to have the largest outfield out of all of the major league stadiums to try and neutralize any advantage that power hitters would have. Also to try to minimize the advantage, in 2002, the Rockies built a room where they humidify the baseballs, storing them at 50% humidity. Now, that has worked some as home runs have gone down by 20% since then, but even so, Coors Field today is still known for being the most home run friendly park in the major leagues. So if you want the ultimate baseball game experience and you want to sit in the stands and catch a home run ball, might as well go to a Rockies game as the ballpark averages over two home runs per game. Coors Field is on the far northeast side of Lower Downtown, and now I've skipped the footage to an area on the far southwest side of Lower Downtown. Anyway, to the left is the Larimer Square Historic District, which was blocked off to traffic when I came through. Denver is said to have begun off of this block of Larimer between 15th and 14th Streets. Larimer Square claims to have several firsts in the Mile High City, those being the first block, the first commercial district, the first residence, the first city hall, and finally, in 1971, Larimer Square became the first historic district in all of Denver. Many of the buildings on Larimer Square are well-preserved, and the block features some of the longest-standing buildings in the city. This is the Gallup Stanbury Building at 1445 Larimer, which was built in 1873, and another is the, um, the, what is that, the, uh, Kongdon building? Yeah, we'll go with that. But it's at 1425 Larimer, which was built in 1870. Wrapping up things with Larimer Square, as historians say that Larimer Square was the city's main business district for many years before falling into being a rundown area in the first part of the 20th century. Restoration began on the block in the 1960s, and efforts allowed Larimer Square to receive the status of being a historic district. And today, the street is anything but run down. There's plenty of foot traffic to support all of the businesses and shops, and it's a nice place to spend some time in while touring downtown Denver. Now, Larimer Square was named after the city's founder, William Larimer Jr., a.k.a. General Larimer, who was born in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. General Larimer also has a Colorado county named after him, in which Fort Collins is the county seat of said county. Larimer Jr. was one of the first successful businessmen in the land that we know today as Colorado, and on his way west he made lengthy stops for various reasons including business and politics in both Nebraska and Kansas. And now that we're diving into all of this history, let's continue to drive around Lower Downtown along with talking about how the Mile High City was founded. Back in 1858, Larimer's two oldest sons wanted to head west to modern-day Colorado back when they were in Leavenworth, Kansas. And back then, Denver was a part of the Kansas Territory. With that said, Larimer, one of his sons, and four other men then started to head west towards present-day Colorado. Historians refer to this group as the Leavenworth Party, as they were once again coming from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is just north of Kansas City. The group traveled southwest from the Kansas City area along the old Santa Fe Trail towards a place called Bent's Fort in southeastern Colorado. From Bent's Fort, the members of the Leavenworth Party then headed northwest until they reached the west side of the confluence of the South Platte River and Cherry Creek. Okay, where is it? Where is it? Okay, yeah, right, right around here. Yes, right here. The specific spot is about right here, right in between the Spear Boulevard and 15th Street bridges over the South Platte River. The residential tower right next to the spot is called the Confluence, of course, being right at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River. But anyway, that spot is a special spot because that is where gold was first discovered in Denver. If you're watching this video and you live at the confluence, as in the name of the tall apartment building right at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River. Yeah, if you live in that building, you live at the spot where gold was first found in modern-day Denver, Colorado. You're just about 150 years or so too late in finding the gold. So, yeah, you missed out. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be you. You should have come through 150 years ago if you wanted that gold. You might want to be a little bit quicker on heading over next time. Yeah, just saying. It's your fault, you know. You should have came by sooner. All right, so yeah, no excuses, uh, no complaining, you had your chance. Well, 
Moving on now is when the Leavenworth party arrived, there was already a settlement here called St. Charles. It was on the northeast side of the confluence of the South Platte River and Cherry Creek. The founder of St. Charles, Charles Nichols, had left to go east when the Leavenworth party arrived. Larimer's group then claimed the town and argued with Charles Nichols about how Nichols never had a binding claim to the site. Larimer also threatened to hang Charles Nichols if they caused them any more trouble. <laughs> Man, you know, despite all of our issues in modern day society, I think it's safe to say that we've improved since those days. But that's how things were in the good old wild, wild west, especially during the Colorado Gold Rush. Anyway, Larimer then claimed the site on November 22nd, 1858 and called it Golden City. The original name didn't last long, however, as the name was immediately changed to Denver City after then-Kansas Territorial Governor James William Denver. The reason why was because they were trying to suck up and have a good relationship with the Kansas Territory, so that is the only reason why the city is named Denver. But little did the people know back then that James William Denver had actually just left office during the same year in 1858, so... Basically, that was a failed attempt at kissing up to the Kansas Territory. I mean, can you believe it? Denver, Colorado is stuck with the name of a governor from the Kansas Territory. So all of you Denver hippies, all of you Denver prideful, yeah, your city's identity is all wrapped up under the concept of kissing up to the state of Kansas. So all of you Denver Broncos fans... Yeah, not only have you been getting owned by the Kansas City Chiefs since 2016, but your city is also named after a former governor of Kansas. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be popular in this city anytime soon, am I? Yeah, I think I'm just going to stay away from this town for a couple of years for my own safety. All right, anyway, um, I got a little bit off subject there. So, yeah, what was I saying? All right, yes. All right, Larimer. On November 17th, 1858, Larimer helped organize what was called the Denver City Town Company, which originally sat on 2,200 acres centering around the confluence of the South Platte River and Cherry Creek. More on the Colorado Gold Rush, as gold was rumored to have been found as far back as 1807 when explorer Zebulon M. Pike met with trapper James Purcell in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in which Purcell then claimed that he had found gold in the Pikes Peak region. However, it wasn't until 1850 when there was gold spotted in the Denver area. Gold was first spotted in Ralston Creek in the modern-day Denver suburb of Arvada. However, it wasn't until May of 1857 when people started to flock to the area, as a man named George Simpson claimed to have found gold dust in Cherry Creek. A U.S. Army scout from Delaware had also claimed to have found a gold nugget in Cherry Creek. Speaking of Cherry Creek, we're going over it right now. But it was the discovery of gold at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River that got the word out to people from the Midwest and East. There were as many as 100,000 people that were thought to have flocked out towards Denver City upon the news of there being gold. There was even another town that was developed just west of Denver City called Auraria. With that said, we're going to jump towards the part of Denver where Auraria once stood, as the rest of my lower downtown driving footage is just going over the same streets that we've already seen. But yeah, let's talk about Auraria. Today, the land that Auraria once sat on is mostly occupied by the Metropolitan State University of Denver, or for short, MSU Denver. MSU Denver is a publicly funded university. Sometimes this is referred to as the Auraria campus, as the University of Colorado Denver and the Community College of Denver also have a presence here. With that said, there are as many as 38,000 students enrolled at the Auraria campus. So let's talk about what happened to Auraria. Once again, Denver City was founded on November 22nd, 1858. Well, Auraria was actually here first, as it was founded earlier that year by a man named William Russell, who was a gold prospector who came from a place called Auraria, Georgia. Russell first ventured out to the Ralston Creek area in modern-day Arvada before not finding any gold. He did, however, find gold at the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River. Auraria grew alongside Denver City and Auraria, was home to the first post office in modern-day Colorado. 
even though this was still the Kansas Territory at the time. Anyway, the two towns are said to have competed for everything, including business, new residents, and even the spotlight in media headlines. The newspaper at the time that served the two communities was called the Rocky Mountain News Weekly, and the paper had a mission to stay unbiased between the two towns of Auraria and Denver City. They even set up their office along the dividing line of both towns, which was the dry creek bed of Cherry Creek at the time. More on all of that in just a second, as this is Ball Arena, home of the Denver Nuggets, who won the 23 NBA championship, and the Colorado Avalanche play their home games here too. They won the 22 NHL Stanley Cup. And when I came through downtown Denver back in July of 22, the Avalanche had just won the Stanley Cup a month prior, so for all of the times in this video that I've made fun of the current state of the Broncos, the town has actually had some really good sports teams to follow here recently. Ball Arena first opened in 1999 under the name of the Pepsi Center, with the name changing to Ball Arena in 2020. Not only is this a multi-purpose sports arena, but concerts and other major events are held inside year-round. Alright, so now back to the history of the town that was once called Auraria. As yeah, the newspaper that covered both towns of Auraria and Denver City set up shop on the borderline between the two towns as the paper wanted to be unbiased. And since the offices for the newspaper were built on the dry creek bed of Cherry Creek at the time, neither Denver City or Auraria would be able to claim the Rocky Mountain News Weekly as their own. That sounds like a great idea, right? A great solution to the problem between two neighboring cities that keep fighting for power. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, except for when it flooded. Because when flash floods came through Cherry Creek, the creek went from being a dry creek bed into resembling the mighty Mississippi. Turns out that building an office for a newspaper on a dry riverbed was a bad idea. Who would have guessed? Well, there was a major flood in 1864 that wiped out all of what used to be Auraria, and by that time, the community had already joined Denver as the founders of Auraria, who once again were from Georgia, had already returned home to help participate in the Civil War as a part of the Confederate Army. That's right. Our man, William Larimer, jumped on the opportunity to claim more land to grow his beloved Denver city the very second that the people in charge of Auraria left. The merge occurred in 1860 to be exact. Well, anyway, that flood during 1864 was the region's first major flood after the area started to be populated, and it caused 19 deaths, along with a great amount of damage to many of the buildings in the community. I was actually able to find this incredible picture here from the University of Colorado Denver website that illustrates Cherry Creek during flood stage back in 1864. It looks like the picture officially is a part of the W.G. Chamberlain Collection at Denver Public Library. And you know, it's not that these new white European settlers in the area didn't have a warning either. Then Arapaho Chief Little Raven was kind enough to warn the white settlers about the flash floods of Cherry Creek and the South Platte River, but nobody took his word seriously, and they ended up suffering the consequences. Historians say that basically the entire area that the campus of the Metropolitan State University of Denver sits on today was essentially underwater during the 1864 flood. Well, over the years, Auraria continued to be a neighborhood of Denver, but the neighborhood also continued to be extremely flood prone. And after several major floods over the years, the city of Denver decided that it would be best to just clear out the city's oldest neighborhood and start a redevelopment plan, and today, all of the land that used to be Auraria is now a part of this massive uh, college campus with the Metropolitan State University of Denver, University of Colorado Denver, and the Community College of Denver, all sitting on the land that once used to be the neighborhood of Auraria. However, something that is pretty neat is that in 1970, when Denver was clearing out the neighborhood, there was a group of Auraria residents that used to live in the community who fought to preserve at least some of the neighborhood. And today, there's a preserved district within the college campus that's called the Auraria 9th Street Historic Park. It's essentially a residential block that has been preserved to give the public a glimpse of the neighborhood that used to be there before the redevelopment plans took place. There are 14 homes along this preserved city block, and there is no longer a street that you can drive on. Rather, it's a sidewalk in the midst of a wide grassy path. 
The Victorian-style homes that stand on this block were built anywhere from the late 19th to early 20th century. The homes here are still being used today as various offices for the university along with some other businesses that are open to the public. All right, well, back to the founding man of William Larimer Jr., as along with consolidating the town of Auraria with the city of Denver in 1859, Larimer became a real estate investor around the same time as he bought and sold land in Denver City several times. The Denver clerk and recorder's office show that Larimer received land 11 times and disposed land seven times in the year of 1859. And between 59 and 1875, Larimer ended up buying 15 tracts of property and selling 20. Well, as time went on, Denver became the county seat of Arapahoe County of the Kansas Territory. Larimer helped bring a railroad to the area from the east along with a line to connect Denver City with the heart of the Colorado Gold Rush mining activity near Pikes Peak. In 1860, Denver City dropped City from its name and it's been known as just Denver ever since. Moving along the Denver history timeline, as in 1863, a fire ended up burning much of Denver's business district. That was only to be followed by the major flood of 1864 that I talked about earlier. Not too long after that, there was an Indian War that broke out, which negatively affected Denver's supply chain, as stage stations and supply lines were cut. When the Union Pacific Railroad was built, which was the first major railroad through the American West, the railroad actually bypassed Denver. As a response, Denver was able to raise $300,000 at the time, which was enough money to build their own railroad to meet the Union Pacific in Cheyenne, Wyoming to the north. Shortly after that, the Kansas Pacific Railroad was built, and it connected Denver to the east, and the city was able to thrive once again, becoming a boom town once silver was discovered in the mountain town of Leadville to the west. Denver then became a supply chain center for a gigantic yet sparsely populated area in the middle of the country thanks to the access provided through the railroads. Colorado became a state in 1876 and Denver was immediately chosen to be a temporary capital. In 1881, Denver was made as the permanent state capital. Moving on as by 1890, the population was just over 100,000 as Denver grew into being the second largest city in the American West. Only San Francisco was larger. In 1902, Denver left Arapahoe County and became its own county. The first population boom ended around the 1900s as the first economic depression hit the area. Growth was able to continue, however, at a slower rate. After World War II, there was another population boom for the Denver region, and at this point, the area saw some of the suburban cities begin to develop. Cities like Arvada, Aurora, Cherry Hills Village, so on and so on. Denver continued to grow as a regional hub for transportation and logistics, and a few oil and gas companies moved their headquarters to the Mile High City during the 1950s, so that was a huge boost to the economy. With that said, let's take a minute here, because right now we're at the intersection of Colfax and Broadway. It's home to the Colorado State Capitol Building and several homeless encampments. I'll tell you this, that all four times that I visited Denver over the past few years, there were specific spots in town where I always saw a tent city. Now, some of these tent cities will get moved around by the city to make things look nice and to make certain residents and business owners stop complaining, but I always saw a tent city at Colfax and Broadway all four times that I have visited Denver over the last few years. And I saw several tent cities in the Five Points neighborhood just east of downtown. And for a video on Five Points, make sure to stay tuned to the channel, as that will be my next Denver video. But yes, those two places right there, uh, Colfax and Broadway and the Five Points neighborhood, you could always bet on there being a uh, tent city. All right, so what are we looking at here? We just passed the Voorhees Memorial, and after that it was the McNichols Civic Center, followed by the Denver City County Building. That is the building that we're looking at right now. But anyway, here's a much better view of the Colorado State Capitol Building. It's a better view than what you'll see from any side camera shot from the Invader. But yeah, that's an awesome shot. You know, I wonder who took that. Yeah, that should be featured on National Geographic or something. Wow, beautiful. Well, anyway, the Colorado State Capitol Building was opened in 1894. And in front of it is a Washington, D.C. style mall that's about four blocks long. So 
that's all good and dandy. And just west of the state capitol is the Denver Mint, which is one of the more historic buildings in town. The word mint in this sense comes from the Latin word moneta, which means money, as in money, 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 money everywhere, money, 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 money everywhere. No, not cool. Okay, well, I'll take the L. All right, well, the Denver Mint was established in 1862, and it opened for business the following year. Denver was an ideal spot for a U.S. Mint, obviously, with the gold mining activity going on in the region at the time. The Denver Mint is one of the four places in the U.S. where coins are made, as the other mints in the U.S. are in Philadelphia, Denver, no, wait, we're in Denver, so, um, yeah, not Denver, but, uh, yeah, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and West Point, New York. And, in fact, every coin that is made in the U.S., you know, every official coin, a part of U.S. currency, has a letter on it, a very small letter, that tells you where the coin was made. So, obviously, if it's a D, then it was made in Denver. All right, so now we're cruising around the Civic Center District, which is where many of the Colorado State government offices are, and there's a few museums here too. But now back to the Denver economic timeline, as I was mentioning the oil and gas companies that moved to Denver after World War II. Well, the downtown area started to see skyscrapers starting in the 1970s. Around this time, since travel had become easier for many people across the country, the tourism industry here in Colorado was starting to be in full effect, with the Rocky Mountains being the main attraction. The good old days didn't last very long, though, as the roughest stretch of economic growth that Denver has seen had to have been in the 1980s, as the Mile High City at that point was extremely reliant on the oil and gas industry, so the 1980s oil bust hit the Denver metro area pretty hard. During the 1980s, the population for the Denver metro area slowed down significantly, while the city proper saw a drop in both the 1980 and 1990 census counts. They say that downtown Denver during the 80s had the highest office vacancy rate in the nation. Really quick, as to the left is the Denver Civic Center Cultural Complex, which includes the Denver Art Museum, the Colorado History Museum, and the Denver Performing Arts Complex. We'll be passing by this complex a few more times on some other stretches of streets, but if museums are your thing, it seems like this would be a good place to check out. So yeah, anyway, it was a tough decade for the Mile High City from 1980 to 1990, but since then, it seems like Denver for the most part has learned its lesson, at least when it comes to diversifying the economy, as not all major cities across the country can say the same. Today, not only is Denver a giant tech hub, but there's still a couple of oil and gas companies headquartered in the area, and there's also more federal employees in Denver than in any other city in the country besides Washington, D.C. You know, there's a lot of industries in this country that go through booms and busts, but having such a strong presence in the federal job sector in Denver has helped stabilize the overall economy for the region whenever the economy is sluggish, like it is in 2023. But having a strong presence of other industries like tech has helped Denver too, obviously, as today it's not just dependent on the oil and gas industry like it used to be. Now today, despite the image that Denver has been developing with the homeless population skyrocketing and crime getting to be out of control, Denver actually has a very nice economy, even post-2020 shutdowns. Now I'm not saying that the economy is perfect, but... It's certainly in better shape than a lot of other major metropolitan areas in the states. For example, there's 10 Fortune 500 companies that call the Denver metro area home. It's also safe to say that the Denver region doesn't suffer from the same brain drain problems that much of the Midwest sees. The rate of college graduates among adults is pretty high for this area, and that's a key factor into whether or not a company will bring high-paying jobs into an area as one of the main factors that a company will look for when it comes to relocate or set up shop in a new market is the talent pool. And the data shows that the Denver metro area isn't short of young professional talent. Now as we wrap things up on the economic timeline for Denver, the economic growth for the region has slowed down significantly since the pandemic, but here you can see the population history for the city of Denver. You can see the era of the 1980s and 90s that I was talking about with the 
oil bust where the city suffered quite a bit there. And after that, however, the city was able to grow significantly throughout the 2000s and 2010s. However, since 2020, like many cities across the country, Denver has been seeing a spike in homelessness and violent crime. And most people believe that that's the reason why Denver has been seeing a decline in populations, the city proper, that is. So we can only wait and see what happens in the future. But when you look at the metro area as a whole, there's still a pretty strong job market here when compared to other medium to large sized metro areas in the states. Plus, there's still a lot of good places to live around here, especially out in the suburbs. But now moving on to the population history for the metro area as a whole, you can see that the population here is just shy of 3 million. The Denver metro area includes Boulder, which is almost an hour northwest of downtown Denver, but the city of Boulder is included in the Denver metro area as officially stated by the U.S. Census. And the metro area is probably going to hit 3 million in the next several years. You can see that the metro area grew by 30% in 2000, which is an extremely crazy number, but it was down to 18% in 2010, 17% in 2020, and so far in this decade, the region is estimated to have grown only by 0.7%. That's on pace for maybe a growth rate of 3 or 4% by the time that the 2030 census would come out. Now on to the economic stats for the city of Denver, as the city has a median household income of $78,000 per year, while 52.5% of adults 25 and older hold a bachelor's degree or higher. The median value of owner-occupied housing units is $459,000. Lastly, the poverty rate in Denver is slightly higher than that for the metro area as a whole. And you can see the stats for the metro area right next to those of Denver. This is a very well-off economic area, I would say. And the poverty rates are pretty low across the board, and you have high paying jobs, but with that comes a high cost of living. And that would be the worst thing about the Denver metro area's economy is the cost of living, the cost of real estate. Since 2020, homes have been selling for less, however, but with the huge population boom that the Denver area saw back from uh, 2010 to 2020, you know, prices around here had skyrocketed. Moving on to the crime rates, and crime has been horrendous in the Mile High City. Property crime more so than violent crime, but still. Forget taking karate lessons, rather try loading up on some pepper spray. I mean, my goodness. And if you're going to be parking on the street anywhere in the city, maybe install one of those motion censored cameras for your car too. My oh my. And I haven't even mentioned that this is all happening while policing has been defunded in the city. You know, Denver apparently took away funding from the police in 2021 and instead put the funding towards mental health professionals. I mean, that sounds good and we do need more of those, but this movement has resulted in a spike in violent crime. So if they could have found a way maybe to raise the funding for mental health professionals if they really wanted to and also keep the funding there for the police department. You know, slashing the budget for the police department, uh, Denver lost, I wanna say, around 200 police officers, but that has resulted in a higher crime rate, which turns into residents fleeing town and living out in some of the suburbs that are safer. And when people leave, so do the tax dollars. So maybe defunding the police wasn't the best idea. Yeah. Denver and pretty much every other major city that has decided to slash its police and safety budget have seen an extreme rise in crime. Yeah, I, I wonder why that would be. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, we can get into more of that in my next Denver video as I need to save some material for some other videos too. I mean, I've been talking for nearly 45 minutes now. Well, like I said in the beginning, Denver still is a pretty city. You know, hopefully it can stay that way. There's been a lot of investment in the downtown area with all the fancy, shiny new buildings over the last 10 years. You know, it would be a shame if all of the billions of dollars that have been invested into the real estate around downtown took a nosedive in value. Since 2000, there have been eight buildings constructed in downtown and the surrounding area that top 340 feet. Just about half of the entire lower downtown area is brand new too. 
Pretty much everything north of Union Station in Lower Downtown has been built within the last 20 years or so. Here we're passing by the Denver Art Museum, which has more than 70,000 works of art inside its doors. Pretty impressive. It was founded all the way back in 1893 as the Denver Artists Club. <laughs> the website brags about being one of the largest art museums between Chicago and the West Coast. And considering that there's not that many large markets between Chicago and the West Coast, that's probably true. And then there's this nicely preserved Victorian style home right in the middle of the cultural center complex here in Denver. And this home was actually built by the founder of the Rocky Mountain News back in 1883. But back to talking about the skyscrapers in Denver, as when it comes to the skyline, there aren't really any buildings that stick out. None of them are really all that architecturally impressive. Rather, it's just the abundance of buildings. It's the collection of towers that make the Denver skyline nice to look at. And of course it helps when you have 14,000 foot mountains in the background, but the tallest building in downtown is Republic Plaza. It's not super tall or anything, but it's tall enough, standing as high as 714 feet. It was built in 1984, and as you can see, it's just a giant rectangular box. There are quite a few smaller cities that have taller buildings than what Denver has, but that's okay because Denver probably has a larger collection of skyscrapers, if you will, than many of those smaller cities. Oklahoma City, for example, has a building that's as high as 800 feet, a little bit just over that, but I would say Denver's skyline is a lot better to look at than Oklahoma City's. We're going to go back to hitting the streets of downtown Denver. This time I'm outside of the car on 16th Street, or the 16th Street Mall. The pedestrian and transit mall is one and a quarter mile long, connecting lower downtown with Union Station and the rest of downtown. The street used to be a regular city street, just like all of the other streets where, you know, cars could drive on it and everything, but in 1982, the street closed to vehicle traffic as only city buses would be allowed to drive on 16th Street. When I was here, the street was torn up as the city is in the middle of reconstructing it, but there's a lot of social amenities off of 16th Street, as you can see. Well, make sure to stay tuned for the end where I'll give Denver a Chris livability score, which is where I give my own personal ranking to cities across the country based on how livable they are for the average person. Until then, enjoy the elevator music as we continue to see more of Denver's central business district and what it looks like today. As we continue along, I'll mention points of interest as we come across them. Heh. <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy the free Uber ride, people. Doesn't happen very often. To the right is the Denver Pavilions, which is basically downtown's shopping mall. The mall opened in 1998. It spans two blocks, and it stands three stories. It has over 40 amenities inside, consisting of entertainment, shops, and restaurants. It also has a bowling alley for those who are looking for a bowling club. I'll have to tell Board Guy about that one. Yeah, I'll let him know.
Well, we're going to turn off the radio now because it is now that time. You can't always trust a circus clown, and you can't always trust a hobo in Lower Downtown. But you can always trust Chris's livability score. The first category is education, and the vast majority of people who have moved to Denver don't have kids. They're young professionals. Over the population boom during the past 10 years, it was millennials who made up the majority of the new population. That being said, Denver doesn't have the greatest public school system. It also doesn't have the worst one. You can find better schools in certain parts of the city than in others. Overall, the district scores below average, however. Most families that move to the Denver metro area would want to find a place to live out in the suburbs, as the suburbs here in Denver live up to the stereotype of a suburb, which is the case with pretty much every major city in this country. Although, if you have kids and you truly are a city snob, that's okay, because like I said, there are some good schools inside of the city limits. You'll just have to do some research and find where those schools are. Education gets a 10 out of 20. Crime is next, and crime in the Mile High City has become a problem. A major problem. Crime is one of the toughest problems to overcome for a large city. It's definitely something that would have me concerned if I were looking to move to Denver. Crime gets a 5 out of 20. Downtown Denver is cool, obviously, as you just saw the entire downtown. It's pretty neat, and there's a lot of things to go do and see. It's what a downtown should be for a large city. That is, until you come across the multiple tent cities that dot the streets. Now, I know that a lot of you are going to want to label me as being insensitive for saying that the homelessness is such a problem here in Denver, but the homelessness and crime kind of go hand in hand. And to be honest with you, both homelessness and crime has had a huge negative effect on small businesses throughout Denver and more specifically downtown Denver. The Five Points neighborhood, which borders downtown to the east, sees more crime than any other Denver neighborhood. Following that is four other neighborhoods that surround downtown. And downtown is included in that too, so yeah, not good. I have no choice but to give downtown an 11 out of 20 for that. Hopefully it can change. Well, moving on now, as despite those problems, Denver has a strong economy going for it, no doubt about it. I feel like things are better once you get into certain suburbs, but the overall economy for Denver is pretty strong. In fact, there are only six metro areas in the country that are Denver's size or larger that have a higher GDP per capita than the Mile High City, so the economy gets a 16 out of 20. Recreational opportunities is next, and there are plenty of options for mountain and winter sport lovers once you head west into the mountains. The city overall is a very pedestrian-friendly city, And the only thing lacking in this category would be water, as there's only a handful of large enough reservoirs around to put a boat in and enjoy driving around on a jet ski. Recreation also gets a 16 out of 20. History is next, and when you compare Denver to other large cities in the U.S., Denver actually does not have as much historical significance as most others. I know that will upset some of you. I mean, sure, the history of Denver is neat and everything with the gold mining activity, but it's not as rich, no pun intended, of the history of a place like, let's say, San Francisco or Chicago or Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia. I mean, that's okay because the quality of life in Denver is better than some of those cities, especially those in the Midwest and East. But Denver just really isn't as historically significant as some of our other large U.S. cities. A lot of that has to do with the location of Denver being in the middle of the country out west. A lot of this was barren land when the eastern seaboard was being developed, so to speak. And there's no large body of water. A lot of our historic cities in this country are along the coastline or maybe the Mississippi River or the Ohio River, something like that, just a river that you can uh, ship goods on because for a long time, shipping was the best means of uh, transportation in this country. So yeah, Denver is not as historically significant as many of our other large cities. History gets a 12 out of 20. Amenities is next, and Denver does not lack in amenities for a big city at all whatsoever. 
I mean, whatever it is that you're looking for, you're likely to find it anywhere in either the city or somewhere else in the metro area. Amenities gets a 17 out of 20. And lastly, the cost of living in Denver isn't great, as I've mentioned throughout this video. It might not be Southern California prices here or anything, but it's not cheap. The cost of living in Denver is 11% higher than the national average. Cost of living gets a 7 out of 20. Overall, the Chris livability score for Denver, Colorado is 96 out of 160, putting it in a tie for 6th place out of all of the cities that I've done this for so far. Final thoughts now, as even though Denver scored higher than I thought it would on the Chris livability score, I'm not sure if that score reflects my true opinion on Denver. The problem with Denver is that the highs are really high and the lows are really low. <laughs> the highs being that the economy is great here and you have access to great recreational opportunities within the mountains and you have a really good chance to live a great life in Denver. But the lows are very low. I'm very concerned about the opioid crisis in town and the ever-growing number of homeless people. The number of homeless in Denver shot up from about 6,000 to over 9,000 over the past year. Crime has grown to be out of control here too. Someone that I know from the Midwest who moved out to a suburb of Denver recently shared on social media how they had their car either broken into or vandalized five times over the seven year stretch that they moved to the area. And all five of those times that this person had their car broken into was, you guessed it, in downtown Denver. Whether it was parking on the street or in a parking garage, whether this person was going to a Broncos game, a Nuggets game, or a concert, or maybe they were just going to downtown to socialize and check out the scenes and the restaurants and the things to do. It was when this person decided that they wanted to spend some time in downtown Denver that they had their car broken into five times or vandalized over a seven year stretch. This is a real story, it's unfortunate, but this is the current reality for the Mile High City. And if I were to move here, I wouldn't be looking to move in the city for those reasons. I would probably be looking to live in the far southern part of the metro area or maybe somewhere west like Morrison or Golden. Anyway, I say that to say that Denver is a cool place. And if you've never seen the Rocky Mountains and you're looking to start traveling, you should definitely go see the Rocky Mountains. It's not like you're going to get mugged if you come visit. I mean, the chances of something like that happening are very slim, but of course, still take the extra precautions. Don't leave valuables in your car. And yeah, try to park in a parking garage if you're going to go to downtown, if you can. Well, overall, I really do like the metro area, but I like the metro area more than I like the city. But honestly, that's pretty much the case with everywhere in the country these days. As cities everywhere in this country continue to see problems with high crime and high cost of living, and the suburbs continue to be some of the best places to live in the United States of America, the suburbs of these larger cities throughout the country is where you can find the best quality of life, no doubt. Well, with that said, I do end the video here. And if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor and make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already, as doing all of those things helps these videos destroy the evil monster that is the YouTube algorithm. Also make sure to hit that notification bell and select yes so that you can be notified every time that I upload a new video. If you enjoyed this video, then you might enjoy checking out some of the featured playlists on this channel. Videos with amazing insights on other places like what you saw here can be found in my Denver playlist, my USA Large City Downtowns playlist, my Colorado playlist, or in my USA State Capital Cities playlist. Last but not least, if you can't get enough of me on here, you can always go follow me on my other social media accounts, and those links are below. We'll see you next time. Peace!